May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Cuke Audio Podcast. I'm D.C. Pubov, Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, preserving the legacy of Shinju Suzuki and those whose paths cross his, and anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So uh, today we have a guest, Doris Walter. I met Doris uh, through uh, Dharma Sangha, Richard Baker's group, and um, she was... um, in, uh, highly involved with the uh, European Buddhist Union or the German Buddhist Union. Actually, that's clarified in the podcast. And uh, uh, her teacher, uh, she's uh, is um, Kenzi Norbu, uh, also called Zongsar Jam Yang Kenzi Rinpoche. Um, and um, he's a uh, uh, highly respected uh, teacher of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, he's from Bhutan, and he's also known for the films he's made. Uh, the, the first one was The Cup, about um, hmm, some kids in Nepal and Tibet or Bhutan or somewhere uh, wanting to see uh, the World Cup. Uh, anyway, you'll hear about that. So uh, Doris was, um, uh, she came to Bali to, to do some of her uh, Tibetan practice, you know, on a, on a retreat. And uh, she stayed with us a little, and we found her another place uh, that accommodated her very nicely. I mean, she needed a kitchen. And, um, you know, introduced her to some... Uh, to a Swiss friend, uh, you know, uh, that is still part of the uh, larger Germanic tribe. <laughs> and uh, our Swiss friend up north, uh, Evelyn, uh, uh, introduced her to uh, a woman from over there, maybe Germany, who had a, a homestay that where uh, Doris stayed. And... Um, Anyway, we saw her a few times, and so she was here. I said, uh, we were talking, and I said, hey, let's do a podcast. So she went in one room, and I was in another, and uh, I was here in my studio, and I called her up, and here we are. So um, when you hear the bell, if you're of such a mind, hit pause and meditate or whatever for as long as you wish. And when you're ready to come back, hit unpause. And we'll be here to hit the bell to end the meditation or whatever. And we'll give Doris Walter a call. Hello, David. Aha, there you are. And you sound fine. Good. Okay. Good. That's good. So, Doris, how are you doing? I'm very well. <laughs> yeah. I'm... Doris uh, uh, Walter, it's that uh, W A L T E R. O L. Oh, W O L T E R. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I get you and Roland mixed up. He's. Mm-hmm. He's. He's, He's W-A-L-T-E-R. Yeah. And you all have uh, worked together. 
And, and uh, anyway, we'll get into that later. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would like full disclosure here is that Doris is our house guest right now, and she's uh, uh, in a nearby room <laughs> talking to me. <laughs> anyway, um, Doris, uh, why, don't, why don't you uh, refresh my memory and uh, tell me how we met. Oh, we met about 10 or 12 years ago in Zeuthen, which was a small retreat center, which uh, Roland, I, and a few others had installed near Berlin. And you were kind of friends with Roland, and uh, he found out that your book, Crooked Cucumber, has uh, no more edition coming out in German. So as we had just uh, founded a small publishing house called Manu Gosha Edition, we decided that we will pick up your book and just uh, revise the translation and uh, bring it out in German again. And we managed to. That's how we learned to know each other. Well, when, how long ago was that? Yeah, my memory for years is not so accurate. I think it was like 10 to 12 years ago. Yeah, even yeah, I think more like 12. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and I was over there staying at your, uh, 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 Johanneshof, mm-hmm. uh, Richard Baker's uh, place. And uh, he and I, I was traveling with him and he was doing like, like workshops. Is that where we met in one of them? Uh, we also, a few years later, uh, it's about five years ago, we met at Johanneshof, where I had organized a workshop for German Buddhist Union. Uh, and the two speakers were David Schneider and Baker Roshi. And yeah. in a way, you appeared as a third participant in that round to talk about, I think the theme was Sangha, but I don't remember that clearly. Oh, yeah. I wasn't a presenter. I was just, uh, you know, he just asked me, he just said I could come. And I was there uh, in Germany. Yeah. So, oh, that was, uh, that was just um, almost eight years ago. When I went there for the uh, 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 the 20th anniversary of Yohannesov and uh, ah. and Herr Baker's uh, 80th birthday, oh my God, which means he's going to be 88 mm-hmm. soon in April. Yeah, wow. Uh, yeah, um, and I I met so I met you with Roland. Uh, just outside of Berlin mm-hmm. in that uh, uh, center uh, for your Tibetan uh, teacher and practice. Yes. In Zeitun. In Zeuthen. <laughs> Zeuthen. All right. Zeuthen. Uh, and um, uh, who, tell us about your teacher. Uh, yeah, my main teacher is Zonza Kienzerembuche. And he's a Bhutanese who is, uh, has been trained as a Rinpoche, as a Tibetan Lama, and uh, works all over the world. And he has also become famous because he's by now done uh, five art house films. And he's also active with translating the Kangyur and Tangyur into English and into Chinese. And sponsoring, uh, through Kienze Foundation, he's sponsoring lots of projects so that even people from the West get financial support to be able to study and practice Buddhism, which is a yeah, lot now, in the East. One thing I'd like to add is that the film seeds made have, have been very well received. Well, at least the, the first uh, couple. Uh, the first one, I think, the uh, which I remember well, it was the cup. Yes. About mm, kids in Tibet or no in Nepal in northern India in Beer, where he's actually having his own monastery. Is is that up near where uh, the 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 um, 
the uh, what's his name the, the the guy who's considered second to the Dalai Lama the, the the you know that tall fellow what <laughs> I don't know who you're talking about well uh, well Bia is near Dharamsala where actually the Dalai Lama resides. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Beer is also uh, a parachute gliding uh, space with many tourists, but uh, has also many monasteries there. And there the film was uh, filmed. Oh, okay. okay. Well, wait a minute. I just can't. I'm blanking out on the name. He's second in. He's, he's second to the Dalai Lama in terms of being famous. The. The. Uh, uh, you know, the, the black hat ceremony was done by... Oh, uh, His Holiness Kamapa. Yeah, Kamapa, right. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that, is Girnir there? Um, this I actually don't know. I, I hear that uh, Kamapa is now even in Germany for quite some time, and he's also traveling in the U.S., so I don't know where his uh, place in India oh. is, where he resides. I but I went I went there and heard him speak and uh and then I went back and uh somebody arranged uh actually a guy that had left um you know uh the uh Tibet with the Dalai Lama back in the 50s arranged f uh for me to have a private session with the Karmapa mm -hmm. and that was neat um uh, and uh yeah he was very stunning looking uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, but um, anyway, so so your teacher is um, he's famous for those films, but he's very, you know, uh, you don't really think of that. You just think of him as your teacher. Right. Yeah, very true. But I'm also happy that he's so much out in the world and out in, in the art kino, uh, cinema scene. And uh, does lots of other things. Um, so he's not a secluded monk up in the mountains, but he's really into the world. And that is also part of our practice, not to only go into retreat and uh, work with your own mind, but also be out there with people. It, is, is he the one you were talking about yesterday where you said, actually, he's not a monk? Yes, he's not a monk. But doesn't he wear monk's robes sometimes? Well, they have different kinds of robes uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, and the so-called Rinpoches, which is uh, the these uh, reincarnations that are aware of their former lives, uh, or said to be aware of their former lives, they also wear robes which uh, to us look like monk's robes, but uh, other people... The Tibetans themselves, they know exactly who's a monk and who's not a monk. And uh, my teacher, he wears these robes for when he teaches normally, but also in everyday life. You can see him in blue jeans or other, other things that we also wear. Yeah, that's really neat. That's really neat. And now you came, uh, why don't you tell us uh, why you came to Bali? Actually, I went here to do a retreat, and uh, I was lucky to have you as old friends here to start off. And uh, so you and your wife, Katrinka, helped me a big deal in finding good places to do my retreat. And um, I had to do a, to fulfill a commitment that I was doing uh, a certain practice for either four times a day, two hours, which makes it eight hours, or to do it in two months, only two hours, two sessions of two hours per day. Sorry. And I mm. chose the two-month option because then I could also do some walking and swimming next to it. Mm. Mm. Where I integrate my practice into my daily life already while I'm doing retreat. Hmm. Um, and uh, is there anything uh, you can say about 
your practice or is it secret or what? Well, this kind of practice I'm not allowed to talk about, but I can say something generally about practice in Tibetan Buddhism, the, the yeah. varieties of practice you want me to do? Yes. Yeah, uh, I mean, Tibetan Buddhism or Vajrayana Buddhism is kind of known for the speciality that Vajrayana has a, a big range of methods. And uh, this actually starts with Shamatha and Vipassana also, as in, in all other Buddhist traditions. But then there's also uh, practices like uh, sadhana, which is uh, reading uh, a certain visualization, uh, developing from uh, you praying to someone, taking refuge, uh, uh, developing bodhicitta, and then you imagine uh, like Shenrezig, the goddess of, or the god of, uh, or the representation of compassion in front of you, and maybe in the end of the practice, after also doing some mantra, for example, uh, like Om Mani Peme Hung would be the mantra for Shenrezig, uh, then you would uh, possibly merge with that deity or representation of compassion so that you yourself become like Shenrezig. And uh, then there's other kinds of practices uh, where you offer uh, things to na back to nature, there's practices of compassion, like you uh, put other people, uh, you see them as more important than yourself, and, uh, and so on. So there's lots of practices, and about most of the practices you can talk, but in these practices that I was doing, uh, we, we have a kind of a vow that we shouldn't talk about them outside. Yeah, yeah, that's very common. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's discouraged in by most Zen teachers to talk about your practice, or yeah. uh, your and you know, uh, people get competitive and bring their personal uh, uh, issues in with yeah. things yeah. we talk about. It. It's hard not to, uh, and and also we want to share, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, now one. One uh, thing your teacher suggested that you were talking about yesterday, uh, I, I think is noteworthy, is um, uh, just take some time, uh, maybe a day, maybe some hours in a day. Uh, uh, I think you were trying to do a day where you don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. I including you don't practice, right? Yes. And I, I thought for a minute, I thought, well, Actually, not doing anything is is a good practice. <laughs> it is really a very difficult practice, as I realized. Yes, and uh, it's it's already in uh, some kind of higher meditation. You also don't do much except looking into your own mind and seeing what, what happens in your mind. And this is kind of similar. Um, you don't do anything, or you just are aware of whatever appears in your mind and um, don't try to react or judge about whatever appears. And I realize it's quite hard to do, and also it's very hard not to get entangled with your iPhone, your computer, with any communication with the outside world, and just leaving things as they are. Yeah. That's... Uh, yeah, very In, good. <laughs> indeed, indeed, um, a noble practice. Well, so um, uh, were you? Where were you born? Uh, in In Germany, I was born in Oldenburg, which is in the north of Germany, quite near the Dutch border. Hmm. Hmm. And um, how long ago was that? Pardon. Say again. W when were you born? I was born in 1953. 53? Yes. So oh, you're a youngster. Yeah. Nine year old, years old. Um, oh, my gosh. Right. Um, and uh, so 
What's your oldest memory of having some uh, mm, spiritual seeking uh, or, you know, uh, thinking that mm, there's more to life for what is reality or whatever? Uh, How far does that go back? It goes quite back far into my childhood. I had not a very good childhood. I had some terrible time in, as I was a small kid. And I was always hoping there was something else in this life. And um, actually, uh, at, at a, quite a young age, but I was already going to school in the afternoon. I was just sitting on the sofa and doing nothing and just looking into the air. And nothing happened in my mind and became quite calm. And I enjoyed that state so much. And when I was a little bit older, somewhere I heard the word meditation. And I was extremely attracted just by the word of it. And also by words like Himalaya. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was about 16 years old, there was a public talk about a tour to the Himalayas. And uh, I, of course, went to it. And then that person was also advertising doing transcendental meditation. Ah. So when I was 16, I was the, becoming an adept to transcendental meditation because this Maharishi Mahesh Yogi was also the teacher of the Beatles, who I adored at that time. Teacher of whom? The Beatles. Oh, oh, yes. Burn me, yeah. John Lennon. Paul McCartney, etc. John Morrison, <laughs> not to forget him. <laughs> uh, yeah. Please continue. Um, so I did that for a year or two, and then I realized they want to sell me the next steps <laughs> for quite some money, and I skipped that. And uh, started reading all kinds of books uh, about Zen Buddhism. At that time, the first books on Buddhism were mostly on Zen Buddhism in Germany. And I read... Do you remember which ones? Actually, a lot of them were by this Daizet Suzuki Roshi, the other Suzuki. He wasn't Roshi, just Daizet Suzuki. Okay, okay sorry. And then Alan Watts. I read all of the books that were published in German by Alan Watts. And Chugyam Trungpa. And ah. that was not Zen, of course, but uh, <laughs> uh, he was also available. And uh, then some German uh, books on uh, the tea ceremony and how to work with the brush. There were some, some German authors also. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that led me slowly into trying meditation. And when I realized I sit in front of a white wall, I had so many thoughts. I just decided, okay, I'm not the one to be able to meditate because I, I seem to be a person that has too many thoughts. <laughs> there was no teacher to tell me this is already a first step in meditation to realize how many thoughts you have normally. So I, I kind of let the cushion go, let go of the cushion. But then I met Aikido, the Aikido world. Mm. And uh, the... Zen Dojo in Berlin, where the Aikido lessons uh, happened, uh, there was also a teacher who was calling his uh, his art, he called it Zen Aikido. So there I could combine sitting and uh, moving. Mm. Actually, after one or two years, when these uh, movements of Aikido beca became kind of something I could do without thinking, then I realized I could just move joyfully with others on the tatami and have an empty mind. And somehow it, it came about that uh, I felt I was, I was doing meditation and movement. So yeah. it started me off in a, in a different way of viewing meditation. Mm, that's good. Mm-hmm. Ah, so uh, what what 
What happened next? <laughs> next, next was that um, I made my exams and I wanted to fulfill my wish to become a sannyasin because I was very much involved with people who were following Osho or Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh at that time. Aha! And uh, I wanted to become a sannyasin, but not in Berlin with someone, but I wanted to see that master before I become a student. So I booked a plane to India, but uh, at that very time, uh, Osho had gone to Oregon or had, yeah. had flown to or Oregon. And I decided still to go to India because I also wanted to see the Himalayas. And mm. uh, I stayed for half a year in India. And after six months, my sister, who had accompanied me, uh, left back, going back to Berlin. And then I was all on my own and started a uh, workshop on Tibetan medicine, followed by meeting the Dalai Lama in Bodh Gaya, then falling in love with some crazy monks in Bodh Gaya, following them to Dharamsala and beer. Yeah, and then I took refuge in the monastery of uh, Thai Situ Rinpoche, who is also actually related to the Kamapas lineage. Mm. And uh, in that way, I've then officially become a Buddhist by taking refuge in a monastery. Mm. Wow. And that's neat. That's neat. So what happened next? <laughs> Uh, I had to go back to Germany, uh, finish my exams for becoming a school teacher for art and German literature. And then I became pregnant. And um, I did some practice that uh, Sita Rinpoche had given me to do, which was actually just reciting mantra, the Omani Peme Hung mantra. And I was doing that while I was pregnant, getting a child, doing all kinds of stuff. Um, and then I invited my first Buddhist teacher, the Dr. Trugava Rinpoche, who had taught, taught me about Tibetan medicine. He, I had invited him to Berlin. And um, after that, another woman approached me uh, because she had invited her t Tibetan Buddhist teacher to Berlin, which was actually Sogya Rinpoche. And uh, through her, I met Sogya Rinpoche, who then became my first, uh, well, uh, Buddhist teacher that I followed uh, coherently, you can say. Mm -hmm. and I started working for him and organize his workshops and, uh, yeah, became deeply involved in a, in a Buddhist Sangha. Mm. And where was Sogyal Rinpoche... Uh located at that time uh, he was actually mostly in london and paris at that time and he's at that time started off also um, becoming very well known in germany and the time that i worked for rigpa in germany uh, the members uh, in the first 10 years were from zero coming up to 1000 so the german sangha quite quickly became the biggest sangha in europe and he also mm. had sanghas in the U.S. and Australia, so it was quite a worldwide sangha. And I was very involved in, in many aspects of the work, became f from a mere secretary uh, on, a, on a voluntary basis. I later became the national director. But it, meanwhile, I had also met my nowadays teacher, Zonza Kensubuche, in organizing a, a weekend for him in, in the context of the Rigpa Sangha. And uh, in a way, it was possible to have these two teachers together, even though um, Zanza Kensamuchi was more close to my heart, it uh, turned out. Hmm. Well, you were with Sogyo for how long? Oh, for many years. I worked for, for Rigpa for 13 or 14 years. And uh, I still... Uh, well, now, what is that, Rigpa? Rigpa is the organization that Sogya Rinpoche founded in, in the West. Oh, okay. 
It's okay. called Rick Pa. And you were doing publishing for him. Yes, and uh, but also following, uh, like organizing uh, retreats for him, and uh, following him on conferences where we actually met with Baker Roshi, who was mm -hmm. also one of those uh, people that reappeared in different conferences in the spiritual world in the seventies, eighties, in no, th this was in the eighties and nineties in right. Germany and Europe. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I'm still involved with Rigpa because that's kind of my my uh, longest known sangha, and I'm I'm sometimes teaching in Rigpa, even though my main teacher is Dong Zaken Hmm. Hmm. I guess every one of us has their own ways in relating to different teachers that speak to their heart and. That's also happening to me. Ah, now, um, so uh, you, you got married at some point. Married? Uh huh. No, I never, I never got married. Oh, you never got. Oh, you know, I was getting you mixed up with uh, <laughs> with uh, Linda. Yeah. Okay. Who's here? Uh huh. So you got pregnant. So. Uh, uh, did you have a child? Yes, I had a child, Jasper, and uh, he's now 36 years old, and um, he's a good guy. <laughs> ah, that's great. What does he do? Um, he has been doing many things, and now since five to ten years, he's working as a tourist guide in Berlin. And oh, he's right. Really doing quite a good job there. And, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember now talking to you about uh, like if uh, Katrinka and I get to Berlin, he can show us around. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that would be neat. I love Berlin. Um, and you you were involved, well, th this uh, woman, um, uh, writer, artist, what is she? Uh, the one whose estate you've been dealing with. That, uh, oh, Dorothy Yanone. Now, now, who's she? Dorothy Yanone is an artist, an American artist that lived in Berlin. And she was actually the one, the first uh, to invite Sogia Rinpoche to, to Berlin. And that's how I learned to know her. And we had a long-term relationship. And that's why she um, asked me to care for her flat and also for her funeral and everything if she was dying before me. And uh, actually, this happened last December. Yeah. So you've been very involved with that. But she had a big following. And, and what did she do? I can't remember. Um, her art is very hard to describe, uh, but it's... Uh, she's done a lot for the sexual liberation of women and uh, to rejoice in the in the sexual or she actually calls it erotic love and uh, that women should be able to in, enjoy that in a similar manner as uh, men do and that was really one of her main messages in her art. And you can see most of the people that she paints, they are naked. You can see their genitals, the uh, male genital mostly upright. And oh, goodness. female genital also very visible, very voluptuous. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an outrageous art. And she was actually... Um, often uh, blocked to have exhibitions because people were saying this is not possible to show this in public. Mm -hmm. And she was fighting for her art. And uh, she even fought for Henry Miller uh, because his books were at a certain time forbidden in, in the U.S. And when she came with one of his first works to the U.S., Something the title is something with cancer. It's a very famous, tropic of cancer. Tropic of can yeah, tropic of cancer. And she had it in her suitcase, and the police uh, 
said she cannot bring this into New York. And then she fought with the court against that, um, against that they had forbidden that book. And she won. Oh, she won the uh, dropping yeah. of can. Did she get any help from, um, let's see, there was Evergreen Press. Uh, there were, Bernie Rossett might have published it. I, I don't know. I don't know yeah. all the things. Uh, yeah. but when, when she had died, I found that book in her bookshelf, and there was a very nice... Uh, uh, Inscription by Henry Miller. By Henry Miller. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Wow, that's neat. Uh, so, and you're involved with uh, seeing that her art is dispersed right in her yeah, estate. Yeah, well, her gallery takes care of the art, and I take care of everything else. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's really neat. That's really neat. Um, hmm. Well, um, let's see. Is there is there uh, anything we're not touching on here? What What do you think about the state of um, of uh, Buddhism in 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 Europe and Germany these days? Yeah, I've actually been quite involved with the German Buddhist Union, which is an entity uh, that uh, is kind of the umbrella for all the different Buddhist uh, groups in Germany. And meanwhile, there's more than 60 groups in, in, in the German Buddhist Union organized under that umbrella. And I've, I've been creating a study program for that. Um, and uh, I see that actually... Buddhism in the West has a very important function because for us now here in the West, we are completely free to choose which tradition we want to follow. And this is something quite new in the world because the last 2,500 years, you were either born be, being a Buddhist or you would have another religion and you wouldn't freely choose to become a Buddhist. And right. nowadays, uh, there is a lot happening that actually we in the West try to find the essence of Buddhism because so much in Buddhism was colored by the culture that uh, the Buddhist uh, teaching adapted to. And Buddha himself has very much adapted to the Indian culture, for example, and he's built on that and he's changed quite a lot from the Hindu religion. Like, for example, he never accepted the caste system. Right. It was a huge uh, social revolution for everybody who became Buddhist. And yeah. uh, nowadays we can actually see how much uh, each of the Buddhist traditions have been modified by the culture that it uh, adapted to. But still, the essence of Buddhism is available in all these different traditions. And we now have the chance to, to get to the essence in comparing and seeing uh, what the essence is nowadays. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a very good point. Uh, and not only were people born Buddhists, they were born a particular type of Buddhist. Yes. You yeah. know, even in Japan, let's say, uh, it you would be born into a family that, say, was uh, Jodo Shinshu or Soto Zen. Mm. Even that, you would be born into a, a family that associated with a particular temple and yes. a particular lineage. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the uh, questions that uh, somebody who wanted to uh, uh, become a, a monk or a nun or practice more deeply uh, and not just be involved with the ceremony when it was obligatory sort of had a choice. Uh, they did have a choice of, say, I'm looking at Japan, of... Uh, 
study with the person who was nearest, the teacher who was nearest, the priest who was nearest, or going out and looking, seeking uh, a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a tradition of that. I I think in the, in a lot of Asia that there was that possibility, but it was that uh, it, 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 especially in early Buddhism, but it continued. There was a split between priest and lay. Yes, that, that has been uh, severely uh, modified in the West. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I can see, at least for the uh, Tibetan tradition, there is a very strong, there are several very strong lineages of lay practitioners. And actually in the history of Tibetan Buddhism, because there were lay practitioners, uh, it, the, the Buddhism has survived because there has been a, a very mischievous king, Langdharma is his name, who killed all the monks in all the monasteries in, in Tibet at a certain time in, before the medievals, yeah. And uh, so these yogis or lay practitioners, they, they could hide their religion and they survived and they could hold the lineage. So in Tibet, both lay and monks and nuns um, are valued and uh, I see also that in the West now the the lay practitioners become more relevant and also more accepted by those that only practice in the monasteries yeah, I, yeah. in a yeah. way we have more more say in Buddhism even though uh, some of the traditions in Germany they didn't want to become member of the German Buddhist Union because it wasn't automatic that their abbots would become the leaders of the German Buddhist Union, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and as there are also lay people in the, the uh, as a director of the German Buddhist Union, they were actually elected. They couldn't couldn't accept that, but um, I think we are working on that slowly, slowly. Also, how many how many how many groups are there with uh, that sort of uh, attitude? There are many, but most of them are not part of the German Buddhist Union yet, which is sad because these are all the Thai people, the, the Chinese, the Vietnamese that live in Germany since 50, 60 years already. Yeah? All the uh -huh, uh -huh. refugees from, from Vietnam, for example, or all the Thai ladies that were married from German men and taken to Germany, they also have their... There are temples there, yeah. So um, is this a, a religious divide or a cultural divide? Uh, the, uh, you, you know, there's sort of like cultural uh, Buddhism has continued in America where, uh, and, and then there's, mm, you, you know what I mean? There, there's Buddhism that's more associated with the culture and the priests as as it was practiced in the foreign country, Thailand, Japan, China, yes, Korea. It, all uh, it's in and Japan it comes, also, yeah. Yeah. And we have, for example, um, created Vesak feasts where they all come together. Uh, people from uh, these, I say, more modern lay uh, versions of, Tibetan and Japanese and other kinds of Buddhism, and then all the traditions that are more uh, related to Asian people who live in Germany. Yeah, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, then we have like they do the kitchen, they they feed us with all the good stuff from Asian cooking. They do the dancing and all these things, and of course they also have monks and uh, abbots who do some public talk. But then also uh, Western people do some talks or guide meditation. So in a way, there's also ways to come together during Vesak and other events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was certainly true in the San Francisco Zen Center. I mean, uh, Suzuki was eventually uh, asked to choose between the the Japanese-American congregation and 
the uh, practicing uh, congregation, you know, that was more involved with Zazen, uh, mm -hmm. which was almost entirely, uh, you know, Caucasians. Uh, and uh, he chose, you know, his Zazen students, uh, but he he didn't li he didn't want to he he wanted to continue both, and he wanted each of them to influence the other and evolve together, but uh, it, it, they they'd become um, we'd overrun their temple. I don't blame them, you know, mm. and and uh, the cultures were different. They, the uh, the Kata, Katagiri's uh, wife, the way she said to me, she said, "They're they're uh, you know the Japanese Americans here. They they they're like uh, Meiji. What she meant is they're they're like uh, they have values and culture of Japanese from a hundred years ago. Mm. And so they were more conservative. She felt than uh, in Japan, but like." Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and uh, actually, it's happened in language too that there are some uh, places in the world, like like if you want to hear Spanish, that the linguists feel is more like Spanish of five hundred years ago. You can go mm -hmm. to a village in El Salvador or whatever, or in Mexico <laughs> yeah. or something. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, well, that's very interesting. Uh, well, is there anything we haven't touched on? I know I'm going to think, oh, God, we didn't talk about so and so. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I haven't heard any of your podcasts before. I'm sorry. So I don't know what the themes are that you're touching with. No, audience. nothing in particular. Mm. Uh, just, just like this, just talk to people and hear what they had to say. And... And uh, of course, uh, uh, I'm very happy to have you on uh, because you're a friend, because you're involved with uh, European Buddhism, and you're the publisher of uh, Crooked Cucumber in German. Yeah. And uh, it's the only uh, published version that is the second edition. The second edition is only available in three places. On the, in the audio book, which uh, is uh, audible, mm -hmm. in the German edition, or yeah. actually don't tell the pub, don't tell Penguin Random House, but it's on cuke.com too, <laughs> uh, in English. Yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah, and I think we should thank uh, Bernd Bender for translating the first one, which was for a uh, a bigger German publishing house, mm -hmm. and for uh, uh, doing the uh, the 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 update for the second edition. He has a, a, a Zen group in Berlin. Are you are you are you ever in touch with them? Aside from that. Yes. Yes, I'm. I'm often in touch with him, and recently I visited Baker Roshi coming there, and I was really amazed with him, even in his old age, traveling and teaching his sangha. And I, know. I really appreciate uh, being connected with your sangha too in that way, because I feel uh, knowing about what other Buddhists do or what what is their main concern or their main practice and how they deal with looking into their own mind. I feel that's that's very valuable to me and my own practice and my own study. So I don't get fixed to my my lineage only, exclusively, but I can uh, get feedback and, um, well, know more about the world of Buddhism through you and others. Yeah, well, you're a very flexible, open-minded person. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, Thank you. And, uh, you know, personally, my experience of Germans is almost entirely German Buddhists, right? Mainly Zen Buddhists, but uh, 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 in Tibetan tradition. And my experience is, I remember saying this to uh, Nicole, what's his name, Nicole? Nicole no. Baden. Uh, uh, and that 
that my my acquaintance with Germans it just seems so unneurotic, so well adjusted. <laughs> like compared to Americans, I think Americans we're a, we're much more on the whole we're much more neurotic. <laughs> and then the response I got there was a few people there when I said this was, uh, well, uh, rest assured there's. Plenty of neurosis in Germany, yeah. too. <laughs> very true. Very true. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, Doris, uh, uh, it's it's been a, a pleasure to have you here after you arrived and before you went off uh, to uh, your places to uh, uh, do your practice. Of course, one of them was a good two-minute walk from here. Yeah. In fact, you just went over there and went swimming this morning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's pretty I, nice. But yeah, I also feel that I, I felt honored that you invite me for the podcast. So I don't know whether I co could contribute anything, but uh, let's you, hope for the best. <laughs> you have, and you've been very clear, and you've said a lot of neat things uh, <laughs> that I appreciate. So um, thank you very much. Uh, and as our podcast concludes, I will open my door and <laughs> go out and talk to you in your room. <laughs> okay. I'll All take right. You. Goodbye. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. You too. So thank you most kindly, Doris. Uh, Doris Walter. And uh, hey, thanks for uh, publishing uh, Crooked Cucumber in Germany. Oh, incidentally, let me say, the German version of Crooked Cucumber originally, uh, I can't remember the publisher, and uh, they called it uh, something that was translated like the, the art of being a Zen master. Um, and um, Bern Bender, uh, if anybody... Uh, remembers him from Zen Center. He has a uh, group in the Junior Suzuki lineage in uh, Berlin now. Uh, he he translated it. Uh, the uh, you know the the audio book I did of it. Uh, I did a lot of you know it had been so long, been a couple of decades since it came out. Uh, so um, uh, I I went over it and made a bunch of. Uh, uh, corrections and and uh, minor changes. And you can see all of them on cuke.com. If you just go to Quirky Cucumber, just go to the book. It has all the changes from the first edition to what I call the second edition. Uh, although the audio book doesn't say that uh, so that it can, uh, you know, be listed with Crooked Cucumber. Um, although Shambhala published the um, audio book and, uh, oh, God, this big conglomerate. Uh, it was Bantam Doubleday. No, it was. Well, anyways, Penguin Random House. It was always under Random House. And uh, at Penguin Random House, it's probably still owned by Bertelsmann in Germany. Anyway, you know, publishing has become so centralized like so many things. Anyway, uh, the audio book, however, I I, uh, I have the audio video film rights, the media rights, uh, which I wanted. Uh, you know, the reason I really wanted it, I wasn't thinking about audio book back then. I was thinking about I didn't want someone to make a movie of it. Uh, and I actually uh, had several people wanting to make a movie and... You know, if they'd offered me a lot of money, I, I might have, um, you know, since, um, um, you know, there's always a certain amount of desperation to get through to the next month, uh, I might have uh, weakened, but they didn't. So I went, nah, I can't imagine it being, but what I can imagine being a movie, I mean, I can't imagine being a movie. What I can imagine being a movie is the Japanese part, especially uh, the part about the war, uh, that part. That could be a really uh, interesting movie. 
because, you know, everything that I wrote in there came from Japanese who lived through it and who did not, um, you know, did not appreciate what Japan was going through. Uh, but, you know, it's sort of like being an American, a much more extreme case, but uh, still, you know, when uh, 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 America, some of our invasions of other countries have upset certain numbers of people here who did not approve of it, but, you know, uh, we kept being Americans. Uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, the, the current version uh, in German does use uh, crooked cucumber uh, it, 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 it's uh, the title. It's, um, oh, here it is. Krume Gurke. That's Crooked Cucumber. Lieben und Lehre des Zinnmeisters should you Suzuki. So, the life and uh, teaching of. I just said Shunyu Suzuki, but they said Zen Master Shunyu Suzuki. I'd say the life and Zen teaching of Shunyu Suzuki is the subtitle. So anyway, it went out of print in German. So she and uh, Roland Wolter republished it. They have uh, mainly they just published uh, stuff of, of against a Norbu. Uh, but uh, Roland wanted to do this. Um, he had a big print outfit, and so they did that. It was very nice. And they had um, all the changes made for the second edition. So it's the only print second edition of Crooked Cucumber. And actually, Doris says it wasn't her idea. It was his idea to uh, publish it. And maybe that's how I met her. I thought I met her at Yo Johanneshof, uh, uh, Richard Baker's place. But I, that might have been after it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, so thanks a lot, Doris. Uh, I do appreciate it. And, um, and then until we meet again, this is D.C. Booba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives. Coming from Sleepy Sanur with Doggett Bandita, guest Doggett Boom Boo, and dear lovely Katrink, and we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. Ooh.